Hi, and welcome to this session at KubeCon. I'm Cheryl Hung. I'm going to be the host for today's panel discussion. Today, we're going to be talking with members from the CNCF end user community and their experience running GitOps in the enterprise. So CNCF end user community is this group of companies who are adopting cloud native and Kubernetes and who get together to share their experiences and figure out what challenges they can overcome together. And I'm extremely honored to have three members of the end user community joining me here today. And I'd like them each to introduce themselves. So I can start. I'm Cheryl, I'm the VP of Ecosystem at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Matt, please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Matt Young. I'm an architect at Everquote on our cloud engineering team. Um, hi, uh, I'm Arab Dalhanan. Um, I head uh, the cloud platform team at Fidelity Investment. I'm also a CNCF board member. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Fabio Giannetti. I'm, I'm leading the internal cloud group at MasterCard. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for joining today. So we've got a couple of questions that we're going to start off with, and we're just going to talk amongst ourselves and sort of learn how you've approached these questions at each of your companies. So first thing, what is GitOps? Um, let's define GitOps and why your organization chose to adopt it. Fabio, let's yes. start with you. Yes, thank you. So for us, GitOps really has been um, a journey to represent our infrastructure uh, through code, as well as what we define the core application or those applications that we deploy on our Kubernetes cluster to run uh, the infrastructure itself. And um, uh, the reason we have chosen this is to allow us to represent everything we have in our internal cloud as a uh, Git uh, commit or Git repository. And why did MasterCard choose to adopt? We did GitOps? choose to, to adopt it because it simplifies our operations and it allow us to have a good handle on the different teams and the different environments where we are deploying our application. So it become very easy to track everything that we run on our uh, cloud environment. Amir, is that the same for you, Fidelity? Yeah, yeah similar to Fabian and MasterCard, like uh, Fidelity, um, we're, we're, the, we're the platform team that's responsible to build the platform of platforms. So um, we are responsible to enable and govern and uh, regulate about like hundreds of clusters and platforms, uh, like different ones, different vary, vary depending on different business unit and different capabilities uh, and features as well. And that was our way of scaling that platform through like GitOps and building like full automation around it. Um, right now, we're running over like 500 cluster plus using that method. So over 500 clusters, you over said? Four, over four, four, 400, four. several hundred clusters, yeah. Cool. Um, and what about you for Matt? I know you run a bit different scale. Uh, sure. So Everquote is a fairly young company, and we've been growing rapidly over the last few years. Um, we, the, our cloud engineering team is a fairly small team uh, embedded within uh, an organization. Uh, our customers are engineering teams and, and, um, and they all like to run fast. So we've spent the last year rebuilding our infrastructure uh, to set us up and position us to support uh, all of this horizontal scaling, if you will, of, of the business. And uh, in order to do that without, you know, um, or quadrupling the size of our team, we've really leveraged GitOps in, in two contexts, one for our core infrastructure, uh, as others have, have said, uh, and it's really for us about toil reduction, uh, disaster recovery, uh, but perhaps most importantly, uh, self-service mechanisms. Um, you know, all of our infrastructure is uh, uh, described in a variety of ways, but it's all in Git, and we partner with a lot of our teams, so if they need to do things faster than we can, PRs are, are, are welcome. So we've been quite successful over the last few quarters at employing a lot of open source methodologies and workflows uh, for how we're managing our infrastructure. Uh, additionally, and I'll be brief, teams are, uh, our engineering teams are also beginning to adopt some of these workflows as well. Although their scenarios are somewhat different, a lot of the same benefits uh, have been realized. 
What do you mean by some of their workflows have been a little bit different? Can you elaborate? Uh, well, sure. So, you know, like many companies in our position um, that are public in the last few years, perhaps, or, or are rapidly growing, we have a variety of systems. Some are very legacy and we're very much made uh, by hand. Uh, and then, you know, as the organization has matured, uh, we've gotten more automation in place uh, and more, you know, automated deployments. But we still have a good number of systems that are not today described declaratively uh, in Git. There's an operational or a procedural aspect to them. Uh, so we are somewhat polyglot in our, in our CI and CD mechanisms. Um, for example, we have Bamboo as well as Flux CD. We'll, we'll get into that later, I think. Um, we, def we, we definitely have some teams building net new things, and, and generally those we would prefer a GitOps methodology, uh, but we have to be realistic that it's not the hammer for every nail, you know, so to speak. Amir, did you have a, something that you wanted to add to that? Uh, and, and, um, and not really, like in just like in one last comment is like, you know, it was very useful mechanism uh, to enable our platform in multi-cloud model, where you have like different cloud providers and different infrastructure beside our private cloud as well. And having that like, you know, differentiate, differentiator in the, in the layer underneath for Kubernetes itself, where you have like different network model and different like, you know, mechanism and, uh, and visualization model as well and programming uh, underneath the hood. Uh, that where actually GitOps was like is abstracted layers that kind of minded all these component and is all these cloud platforms together. All right, thank you. And let's go to the next question. And I think this is the one that it's almost jumping to the end immediately. But what what the lessons did you learn? Um, I like to I'd like you to talk about like the scale of what you're doing, maybe the journey that you've taken to get here, what you would recommend for other people. Um, Amir, why don't you, you go ahead? Sure. So um, I would say like, you know, a few of the lessons learned is uh, number one, understanding the complexity and the whole, uh, uh, the whole like, you know, big picture about like where you're gonna be used and how we can implement that and how we can introduce that to the development team who's building that GitOps model. That was one of the challenges or one of the lessons learned. The second one was mainly as our team is more of like the engineering team who's handing over that automation piece to all the DevOps communities inside the, within the, our business unit. We have about many of them actually in the, in the company. Uh, so enabling this culture and let them understand like how that will work and how that is different than the traditional operational model, how the declarative you know, aspect of Kubernetes and how the declarative aspect of managing your infrastructure, that, that was new, that was unique and new for them. Uh, there is always like this aha moment, like after a while, we're like, how we do that? Where is my process? Where is my validation process? But after, after a while, they get used to this idea. It took a while. Yeah, and I can go next. Uh, uh, for, for us, um, uh, one of the very interesting lessons learned has been ar uh, around audit trail. And so we, because we use uh, GitOps to drive upgrades and new deployment and changes that reflect all the environments, including our production environments, um, you know, the company has set the audit trail based on traditional ticketing systems. And so one of the issues we were facing is that those GitOps operations uh, needs to be mirrored into the audit trail. And so we've spent a significant amount of time to build some automation. So when you do a commit uh, and you create a pull request, uh, we open a ticket uh, automatically. And then uh, the, um, uh, the approach of um, accepting that ticket will automatically give a plus one into our pull request. And we made that plus one mandatory so the, the operation, can, the, the content can be merged unless that plus one exists. And so this has been uh, for us a game changer because it allow us to be SOC compliant, PCI compliant. It made us um, work very well with the rest of the company without forcing us to be, uh, to change the process that the company follow on, on audit. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and and we have similar concerns, you know, um, uh, as we partner with uh, a number of insurance companies and and other other entities. Uh, we have a lot of regulatory and compliance issues, um, not issues but concerns. Uh, and one thing about uh, a GitOps methodology is 
you know, effectively access to Git uh, and the and the role based access control around that uh, is really important to think through because now Git is your control surface, uh, and there's different ways to address them, and we're we're employing similar you know, uh, approaches with automation around web hooks and PRs and things like that. Um, uh, we've had some other lessons uh, as well from the last year. Uh, I, at the top level, I would say UX really matters. Developer experience and, and usability matters. Uh, for example, we're using Flux CD uh, for most of our infrastructure that is in Kubernetes and it's working quite well. Uh, but the primary user of that is our cloud engineering team who knows that full stack. Um, you know, for a new developer or a new development team that's that's just getting started, um, the UX of that is really look at logs. And so there's lots of different tools you can bring to bear, but but think up front about who's going to use it uh, and, and what interactions do they need and what workflows need to be supported um, when, when choosing tools. Um, I'll also say that particularly for Kubernetes workloads and Kubernetes itself, uh, one thing that GitOps will <laughs> really shine a light on quickly when you get to scale out horizontally is how are you dealing with configuration management? You know, between Helm, Customize, and uh, Tonka, and or JSONnet, um, there's a, a variety of, pro of approaches to, to, to not just end up with a bunch of copy-pasted YAML everywhere. Uh, and so, you know, it's worth investing some time in deciding how your organization wants to manage configuration and how you want to abstract out the differences um, it, the rabbit hole runs deep, and there's a lot there. We, in fact, use all three of those tools. Um, it, it's worth bearing in mind up front. I'll also say <laughs> that uh, in terms of uh, workflows around branch management, uh, promotion of code between environments, you know, how are you running things? You know, when you when you move to GitOps, if you if you have gaps there, or if you have varying points of view in your organization you're going to find out quickly. So again, I'm up front to work out how as an organization you, you want to do that. And if you want to support different methodologies, um, just that's all stuff that you really want to think about prior to diving in with both feet. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard the same from quite a few different companies. Um, Matt, you already mentioned this a little bit before, but let's talk a little bit about the toolings and the projects that you're using in your companies to kind of implement GitOps. Amir, can I start with you? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, and like Matt mentioned, actually, we're using similar frameworks around uh, uh, GitOps and in Kubernetes in general, like so Flux is one of them, Helm is the second one. And in addition, we had to start, like we start using as well, like, you know, as a project outside of Kubernetes itself to complete the picture. So completing that ecosystem. So for example, like Fluent D, that's was required for us. It was part of that ecosystem that we had to build and use as well about. Um, uh, Prometheus was another component with Grafana as well, where I had to complete, like, because you need that reporting piece and you need that uh, kind of like, you know, uh, observability front for your cluster management side as well. Yeah, and from from my side, we, we we value a lot the landscape. I think it, it brings uh, all the technology. It gives you the ability to understand the level of maturity. Um, so personally, we used uh, Customize, we use Elm, uh, but we don't deploy Elm directly. We use a templating capability of Elm to convert it, and then we lay Customize on top of it. Uh, we also experimented with Argo CD. We like the declarative versus imperative approach of deployments. Um, one of the things that uh, we would like to see more on the landscape um, is to go more into the details of Helm charts and operators. We use those quite extensively. And, uh, you know, the technology is, the Helm is a graduated project, but inside Helm, many charts are in different state. And so we would like to see those being more mapped out or, or owned by the the project themselves so they become more stable and more reliable and the same applies to the operators we had uh, uh, a lot of hit and miss with the uh, maturity and and, uh, and support and quality of the operators that, that there are around would you agree with that matt you said you use helm as well uh absolutely um uh so 
uh, again, we, we, we started our journey um, with GitOps really at the beginning of this year. Uh, and we have some of the same challenges around, around Helm charts. Uh, Helm moving to its current version and getting rid of Tiller uh, certainly simplified things in that you don't have an orchestrator atop an orchestrator, uh, so to speak, in Tiller. Uh, but we're, we're doing a similar approach today where uh, we're using Customize combined with Helm to pre-render templates uh, so that it's very obvious what's happening. Um, uh, and we're actually beginning to explore using Tonka and JSONnet as they've recently added the capability to import Helm charts uh, into, uh, into a JSONnet um, project. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we, we've certainly evaluated a bunch of other, other things as well. Um, you, know, we're, you know, we've looked at everything from Spinnaker to Argo, GitHub Actions, Bamboo, Flux CD. Um, there, there's a lot of why, and that just kind of scratches the surface of what's there in the, in the community. Um, um, but for us, Flux CD has been very good, uh, particularly uh, because, you know, we have quite locked down environments. You know, we have a lot of security concerns. Uh, and so Flux in particular, since it's, you know, effectively a bot sitting inside the cluster reaching out uh, versus uh, something like GitHub Actions or more traditional things where uh, from outside the cluster you want to authenticate over the internet or over, you know, just so somewhere else uh, to the API server of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you know, we, we don't have to have credentials and keys to the kingdom stored in third-party systems. If you're using a SaaS variant or, or in other internal systems, it's, it's a pull-based model. Um, also consistent with what the others have said, um, in order to make all of this a, a reality, we've adopted a largely CNCF based stack, which includes, you know, Prometheus and Grafana. Um, we've also, when evaluating, you know, what should we use for logging? Uh, for example, we're using the Bonsai Cloud logging operator um, because it's declarative in nature. So once you start down this GitOps um, path and you, and you start seeing the benefit of, oh, I want to change something, I'll make a quick PR that bumps a version number and then like, done. Right, no, no, no toil, no drama. Um, you, you start taking a really hard look at at systems and other building blocks of your infrastructure that are not described declaratively, um, and that's been one big mind shift, I think, in our organization. That you know, it it's just uh, it, it ends up as to, as a filter you almost apply <laughs> to say, well, I have this wonderful thing in place that I don't have to deal with because it's automated. Uh, I don't want to add something that has a manual step to it or that is not declarative and idempotent and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, and I want to I want to build on the on the the point that Matt was making on the giving the keys of the realm. Uh, so one of the approach we use is see we create what we call a control cluster. So it's the cluster where the deployer sits. So uh, the, our Argo CD will sits in that control cluster, which only the platform team have access to. So when a, when an application team goes and uh, made a pull request to deploy something. In reality, the the tool that deploys sits on our control cluster, and that's locked down. Uh, and only we are the only one that has access to it. So that that's been an extra step of um, security that we put in place that our security team liked because it reduced the or, or limited the surface of attack. And in our case, actually, we we built our own framework. We actually, it was released like a couple of weeks ago to the open source communities as well, it's called Kiran. And that's kind of, um, it's a management tier for all the operators that we run today and we govern and call, we, you know, also rise within Fidelity ecosystem. And, and that uh, and it's based on GitOps as well, it's based on Flux. And, and that that framework model basically will allow like the system admin and uh, Kubernetes administration communities inside Fidelity to state what version of what controller and what operators is, is being used for each one of the releases um, and uh, and manage that and push that through GitOps. So it's pretty cool actually because it does allow us to extend the, you know, the number of operators. It's also, it puts them like into multiple level where it's production grade operators or experimental operators that can only get exceed to a certain level of maturity and can all go only go for like a dev level for a development purpose or so. Uh, in addition, it will it does have like a conversion management control as well around that, and uh, it, it does up, you know it follows the same approach for how we can with GitOps you can manage this automation, manage this complexity across like 400 plus clusters. Yeah, I think um, 
I, I think there are challenges too as organizations scale. I mean, if you're a small startup and everybody can fit in the same room, you can just pick a stack or pick a tool and just, you know, all together do it. Uh, in our case, however, you know, um, uh, we're only, you know, six or seven years old now, but, you know, we have existing processes, for example, you know, some teams might use Bamboo or some other system uh, for Sarbanes-Oxley compliance so that we have a, 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 a an audit trail of, of, of changes to the code as, as well as the infrastructure. Um, but then on the other hand, we might want to use Flux. So, so I, I would encourage folks uh, looking at this not to be too absolute and just keep, keep focus on what problems you're trying to solve. You know, for example, uh, you could have an existing uh, ticketing system or a workflow system like Bamboo or Jenkins or whatever um, that you know that is used for compliance and and provides that that audit and that that control workflow. Uh, it could just merge a branch and then something like Flux could pick up and wake up and do it. Um, you know, when you put these systems together and everything is moving in in parallel, um, you know you can make a lot of work for yourself that you didn't expect if you say, ah, oh, well, since this is GitOps, now GitOps has to be our control surface as well. So we need to get rid of things that work just fine and move everything to Kubernetes, RBAC, and Teams and all of that, right? You, you, can, you can put these things together uh, in, a, in a lot of different ways, um, some better than others, but you know, keep, keep an open mind and, and, and be careful of you know, <laughs> rabbit holes because because some of them can go quite deep. And you can you can find yourself doing a bunch of work that, that you hadn't intended on doing or that you actually don't need to do if, if you're not too curious about, about having just one pool. Right? Yeah, That's that a, makes sense. We're loving Flux and we're using it for almost all of our infra. So. Hmm. Okay, awesome. Let's go to the next question. So next one is what how has the lifecycle management of Kubernetes been impacted by GitOps? Um, let me start with that. Like actually, I'm gonna mention like two examples that we that there was a big impact in our in the Kubernetes lifecycle life cycle management using GitOps. So the first one was mainly the cluster management, because similar to Fabian and Matt, we have like a very highly regulated environment. So we have requirement actually to do uh, a rehydration and upgrades and refresh for all of our clusters in monthly basis, uh, which is, uh, it's a challenge because basically you start to have to treat your Kubernetes clusters itself as more of like bits, not kettles, and have to be rebuilt and it have to have the same consistency. It need to be up and running all the time during that and it have to be done in a canary model. And that's what we use like, you know, that approach um, in addition to the complexity of having all of our operators need to be deployed in the same version and the same Matter and patterns for all these clusters that that to get simplified through GitOps because in our GitOps basically in our Git we had three was uh, existing for each one of those clusters and that would have the specs for this cluster and how it look like and when the deployment happen and all the upgrade and the rehydration happen uh, it will take advantage of like you know I want to move from a, a, a minor version of Kubernetes to the next one or a major version or I want to patch my AMI like you know uh, and update like the image that I'm using for my nodes and so on. So it, it was a control management that was very really decent actually. The second use case I, I would call that had impact, our cluster is large, it's multi-tendency. Uh, so we build using a GitOps model as well, a multi-tendency operator. That operator will guarantee the same application onboarding. So for instance, you know, using GitOps in this case, you can define your application, you can connect it to our ticketing system in the back end. You can define who's the team responsible for that, what rules they are, and that operator will take, will take that, it will create its own main spaces, it will connect it to all the Fidelity ecosystem in the back end, it will set up that namespace, it will set up the routing, the ingress, ingresses management and routing rules and the firewalls, or like all the aspect. So at, at the end of the day, you know, the developing team will get like a, a ready environment or ready environment within that cluster uh, for their development effort. Again, uh, GitOps was used in this case. Um, and it, it was actually very like, you know, successful. Like some of those clusters reach out like 270 namespaces or application running in, share, in shared environment. Um, I, I wouldn't say there was another method that we can achieve this kind of automation without GitOps. Yeah, and uh, I'll echo that. Uh, the biggest benefit for us is the automation that we can drive with this, right? So when we have a, a minor release of Kubernetes, we can basically drive the automation from uh, our sandbox environment if that passes the tests 
uh, then we can go up to the dev and we can do selective upgrades of different clusters. So we have a test cluster in every environment plus our control cluster that we can go and upgrade. And then we can move to other clusters. And we have like a hierarchy uh, of clusters depending on the impact that those applications may have. Um, and so we go to a certain order. Uh, the other thing we do is that we express when we create a cluster, teams have the ability to choose a type. And for a type, it could be a single tenant, it could be a single tenant with PCI compliance on it. It could be a multi-tenant or it could be a, a cluster that they use for um, specific uh, things that may be created and destroyed after a while. So all of that is expressed in Git and that will trigger the automation to build all of those, right? Before all this was done through tickets with, with our VM environment for instance, all done more manually than, than what we were able to do. So, you know, definitely um, allow us to see what happened, allow us to uh, automate uh, the majority of the operations uh, meanwhile keeping compliance with it. Yeah, I mean, um, we're operating at a slightly lower scale by an order of magnitude, at least in total number of clusters or, or total number of developers. But um, I would definitely, you know, again, uh, it's sort of a lesson learned, but there's a lot of edge cases uh, when managing Kubernetes clusters generally. Uh, we, we run across multiple clouds. We're running both GKE and EKS in production. Um, uh, and we have a multi-account set, set up and all of that. Um, there can be, for example, race conditions when deploying various operators. Um, there, there are things that... that should just work, but in, in reality, um, you know, sometimes they still do need uh, human intervention. And depending on the size of your team and your ability to completely automate everything, um, you know, you might have to make some decisions as, as we have to, to automate some things that are readily automatable, uh, but take care with others. Uh, going back to the Helm bits, another just small concrete example is, you know, Helm has a plugin model. So you might use a Helm chart that when doing an upgrade, uh, actually executes things right to help my mutate or migrate migrate state. But if you're taking a templating approach and you're not actually running Helm against you, you know in this way, you might actually inadvertently not realize that some upgrade to a Helm chart that was put in uses a plugin, and and that's not being captured by your workflow. Um, uh, so so there are you know exercise caution and and you know just d d just don't assume. Uh, that just because everything is automated, everything everything's working. So so investing in things like Prometheus and alerting, and you know how you handle when things are not going well, um, is really critical. Because uh, particularly with Kubernetes, um, you know, as anyone who's who's used it knows, there's a lot going on, and it's very easy if you're not if you're not conscientiously and intentionally alerting on things uh, to not realize that something might be w not working so well. Uh, and if you have a small team, you might not notice. So, um, yeah, they're, they're... So one thing we do in the, in our oh, sorry, okay. one thing we do in our upgrades in the sandbox to validate that the upgrade uh, happened successfully, we ran Sonoboy and QBench mm -hmm. to basically see that the final result of the upgrade has some sort of compliance to or final state is compliant with CIS benchmarking. Um, and then we run some synthetic tests to see that, you know, you can deploy an application mm -hmm. comes up and all of this kind of stuff. So uh, that's, that's uh, it's been a way for us to enable some automation around, you know, upgrades uh, for, for especially minor upgrades more than major upgrades. Yeah, Sonobu is yet another gift from Heptio to the world, um, for sure. Uh, and similar to Fabio, actually, we have the similar process. We have our own validation process that run after uh, most of these processes, right? And we had to we had a full framework like using Cucumber and others actually to do like validation for each one of these operators. Uh, some of them are very critical, like you know our our secret management integration piece, for example. Like so, that's a that's a required. That's a that's a must. And yeah, I, this piece is like it need the validation. So we. So after each one of the upgrade processes and so on, we have to run like a full validation process and then all the static monitorings after that, like very similar to what you guys do in MasterCard. Yeah, actually the experience of the last year has had us, you know, had me taking a, a hard look at what we do next year around, yeah. you know, should we upgrade it all or should we just install new clusters at the new target version and use, you know, DNS load balancing or canaries. Um, we're also running Linkerd. 
uh, in production across all clusters. So there's there's multi cluster multi cluster routing uh, capabilities that weren't there a year or two ago um, that that also pave the way towards just not dealing with upgrades at all. I mean, uh, if, if you if you've ever worked on a software project, uh, upgrades are always hard. They're just they're always hard, and they're complicated, and they're easy to get wrong, even even with diligence. So. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring, would it, would it be simple to just move to a full disposable cluster model? In reality, I think we're not there given the size of our team. And, and um, if you're using some um, partially managed Kubernetes offerings, like, you know, EKS or GKE, um, they have their own upgrade workflows and, and provisioning a new cluster can, provisioning a hardened multi-tenant you know, scalable cluster that, that has a lot that you put into it to make it that way. Um, uh, the, the challenge for us between rebuild and upgrade is mainly the ecosystem around Kubernetes, not the Kubernetes mm -hmm. upgrade itself. So the difficulty yes. is like around everything else around, like, you know, all the, the security aspect, the regulation, the firewalls, uh, yeah. the config, configuration, the authentication authorization back to some of our data, you know, our data center, like, you know, uh, resources and others. That's where we see the challenges are like for like rebuild besides yeah. to rehydrate every month in, in every way. So, so I have actually a question if you guys don't mind, like, you know, I'm very curious about it. Uh, did any of your development team experience GitOps for application deployment side? Yes, uh, we have, we have, well, so I'll say we are a work in progress, but earlier this year we had a couple of uh, applications uh, move to using Flux for application deployments. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about what comes next for Flux with the new version. I know that I know that the project is doing some work around observability and, yeah. and making the UX around that a little easier. I think for, for for some teams that we have that have onboarded their first few services to use Flux, um, there's been a little a bit of a learning curve. Um, we've also had really good luck um, with our email remarketing team. Um, uh, using Loki to help understand what's happening in Flux. So we've got dashboards, you know, they've got, you know, what, what's happening with the service and, and, and what's happening uh, with Flux. Uh, but again, like that, that tool in particular is, is sort of watch and look for things in logs. It doesn't have a great UX uh, that's broadly uh, accessible. Uh, for us, is 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 a little bit more complex because um, the application teams are uh, basically uh, they have their you know CI/CD pipeline around Jenkins been defined and used for for a very long time, and uh, there are a lot of security hardening and things that have been built on top over the years. So uh, going there and say, hey guys, <laughs> replace all of this with something different. Eventually it will, uh, but I think it's a longer conversation and uh, it's gonna take a good amount of time. Time, so yeah we, we, we've been talking a lot about infrastructure which particularly with kubernetes you know you can you can very quickly deploy flux or rather get ops me mechanisms um irrespective of tools and very quickly get some wins but when it comes to applications again um just like you know it, it'll shine a light on things like uh, oftentimes the the tricky part about uh having applications of the, using GitOps comes with all, everything around that application so we use terraform heavily Right, but how do you actually deal with, you know, all of the things outside of the actual service itself that it uses, the databases, the buckets, the queues, all of that? Um, how do you make that uh, 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 work as well? And there are approaches to do that as well that that we're that we're using. Um, but there there are complexities around that. Or, or for example, many frameworks, the first time the new version of a service hits an older schema, they'll do a schema migration. Well, one of the cool things about GitOps is that you can revert things. Most of times those migrations don't go backwards. So there's a lot of things that like once you get over the initial, hey, I could deploy my service. Um, again, like when you really think through, um, you know, how do you do those things that are not necessarily declarative uh, or if they are declarative, they're declarative plus like Terraform or CloudFormation or something that actually has to be run that maybe can't be rolled back just like, you know, a container version can. Yeah, I did. I did an internal experiment. Uh, was very really an experiment. But we use uh, we look at OM, and so I think you know application um, manifest will, which includes all the 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 con all the dependencies, connectivities, and network boundaries. 
are going to be extremely important to move to GitOps for application deployments. And uh, so the open application uh, model is a new format that came out and um, still evolving, but is a very good starting point if you guys ever look at it. Yeah, I think around January, I first saw the initial specs for C C CNAB, CNAB. Um, we're not using it yet, but I've been following the project over the year, and I'm quite excited by the potential there. Uh, again, it's a cloud native application bundle, um, and I'm not involved with that project. We we don't have you know we don't I don't have my hands dirty from from playing with it yet, but um, you know things like that that encompass not just the application but all of the surrounding infrastructure and tooling that can be packaged together in a versioned bundle. That for us is I'm quite excited uh, about that in particular. And a lot of our folks use VS Code and some of the integrations for um, and some of the other related tools to, to, to CNAB um, are promising as well now that they've matured over the year. And We're pretty much running out of time, so I'm going to have to go on to the next question. Sorry to interrupt the discussion. Um, I'll just give this to Amir to sort of answer this one. So what does membership in the CNCF end user community mean for your teams? Oh, it it did mean a lot. I mean, it started number one, I think for Fidelity in general, uh, it did reshape our like multi-cloud strategy. So right now we have like a very united strategy using like, you know, multi-public cloud provider and even in our private clouds using the Kubernetes technology and, and container technology in general that build this portability between the cloud provider. It, it, it did united um, that the company was one direction around how to manage your workload across multi-clouds. Um, I think it did also add a lot of value for our, our teams, like, you know, going through um, uh, the ecosystem with CNCF, ex the explore to all the projects that's going on right now, understanding what's coming and uh, where is the community is and where to invest. It did also achieve, achieve our, like, you know, work model. Uh, so, like, in the past, like, few months, we started releasing our own open source project, like, we released, like, two of them so far, a connectivity tool called uh, KeyConnect to connect to multi-cloud, uh, multi-clusters and multi-cloud. Uh, with different authorization models. And the second one, which is Kiran, the one that we highlighted like early around like how to deploy like or, and govern operators management. So that she reshape our development model itself, like how we are developing uh, and building all this like management tools for our uh, environments. So um, I truly appreciate like the membership. I think it's great. Fantastic. And I'm really happy to hear that your, your teams are getting more involved with the community and with open source, because that's how all of this runs together. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I really wanted to say thank you to Matt and Amir and Fabio for giving your time and talking about the challenges and the experiences that you faced. Um, if you want to come and join the end user community and meet other people like this, then please go to that link at the bottom. And that is it from us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.